and I want to welcome you just now. <laughs> Greetings to everyone who has joined in today. My name is Lean Snej, and I'm the director of the Arts and Culture Center at the Middle East Institute in Washington, D.C. I want to welcome you all to today's panel entitled Bahraini Artists Across Borders. We have two remarkable artists with us, Masha al Sa'i and Marwa Al-Khalifa, whom I will introduce just in a bit. Uh, sadly, we are not, Jafar al Arabi was not able to join us, but has sent his slides and his comments, and I will be incorporating his comments as we go along. Uh, the panel is one of the several programs coming out of our current exhibition, The Sea of Life, Modern and Contemporary Art from Bahrain, that opened on November 29, 2023, and will be up until March 26 at the MEI Art Gallery. The exhibition is sponsored by the National Arts Council of Bahrain and the REC Art Foundation, and we are very grateful for their uh, support, without which the exhibition would not have been possible. Uh, the show is co-curated uh, by Bahrain-based Haifa Jishi and myself. Uh, Haifa is a longtime gallerist and founder of Al Barih Art Gallery, one of the first platforms in the Gulf promoting Middle Eastern artists globally. And it's been an absolute pressure to collaborate with Haifa to craft this exhibition. Um, it's really a beautiful show uh, that is both uh, visually pleasing and rich in content tied to uh, Bahrain's rich, uh, rich mythology, poetry, and history. If you haven't been and you are in DC, stop by the art gallery. We are located on 1763 M Street Northwest. We're open uh, from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. Uh, from Mondays to Fridays. You can also read more about the show on the exhibition's webpage on our site, mei.edu Arts and Culture, where you will also find a great uh, piece on the Bahraini art scene that is authored by artist, curator, and director of the RAC Art Foundation, Yasmin Sharabi. The show has also just been reviewed by the Washington Post in yesterday's Sunday paper, and the article references the three artists that are included in this program, so incredible timing. If you want also to read the review, you can find out more about it uh, there. Uh, before we go into the conversation, I just want to share a little bit more about the exhibition. We are going to run for you a few slides to see the show in our gallery and how beautiful it is. And I'll just read um, a, a short description of uh, the show. The Sea of Life is a rich representation of a much larger art scene that has been flourishing on the island of Bahrain for decades. The exhibition features 14 artists spanning different generations and art forms, exploring their connection to Bahrain's natural and built environment and the symbolism of water in their lives. Water has been this life force for Bahrain, dating back to the Dilmun civilization as back as the fourth millennium BC. Using painting, photography, sculpture, video, and installation, the artists express their deep connection to the island's landscape, its natural resources, rituals, and mythology. And you can see here a few slides of the show. So if you are in DC, uh, stop by. It's really a wonderful exhibition. Uh, we run gallery tours. We run public uh, engagement programs. This is from the public from the uh, public opening of the exhibition. We were joined by some artists in uh, the exhibition. And um, turning to our program today. As I said, we are joined by two remarkable participating artists, Marwa Al Khalifa and Masha Al Sa'i. And I will be in conversation with them and incorporating some comments from uh, Jafar Al Horebi uh, about their art, the vision that drives their work, how they are tied to this broader art scene in Bahrain. Uh, before we begin, and I introduce them very briefly, their full biographies are on our site. Uh, just if you want to ask a question, please feel free to ask it at any time. For most of you, uh, the Q and A feature is at the bottom uh, at the bottom of your screen, so use that, and I'll keep an eye on it 
and incorporate your questions either at the end or during our conversation. Um, and now, quick introductions, and I'll go straight into it. Marwa Al Khalifa is a Bahraini mixed media artist and photographer who incorporates different materials and techniques to create works that reflect a sense of spirituality, encouraging the observer to contemplate and embark on a personal voyage. Masha'al Asai is a Bahraini multimedia artist and photographer who seamlessly weaves together Bahraini mythology, Bahraini mythology, science fiction, and eco-feminism. Al Sa'i's practice expresses research-driven interpretation of Bahraini mythologies via text, image, and glass. Her most recent work explores collective consciousness embedded in the myth of the Adari Springs in Bahrain. Jafar al Orebi is a Bahraini multimedia artist and painter. al Orebi creates multimedia art using a meticulous process involving observation, layered sketches, etching, incision, and collaging. His work explores the individual's role in society and society's relationship to the environment. And with that, I want to turn to Marwa al Khalifa. Marwa, it's such a pleasure to host you on our platform. Welcome. And I want to turn it to you to speak about the work that we have in the gallery. We'll put it up on the slide. It's entitled Yellow and Blue. And it made also the main image for the article in the Washington Post yesterday. So on to you to talk to us about the work, what it represents, and, and your process. Well, thank you for having us. It's such a... Uh great opportunity to to have this uh, you know we missed being there at the opening but it's it's um it's special especially that this follows the article yesterday um in the washington post um with regards to my piece mm. um this one was the first of when i got into my photo montage so being a mixed media artist i work with different materials uh whether it's wood or fiberglass um i i you know it's unfortunate that i i didn't get to send you different collections but i really wanted to focus on this one because um being now more accessible with photography with our phones i get to have the opportunity of taking just the mundane day-to-day -day life that we think and take things for granted but for some reason you know I love turning in them into art pieces because I just love playing with the image so with this one I was just sitting out looking at the pool and in, in the house and I noticed that there was a bunch of leaves so I went close by and and took close shots um everyone that sees this image I love hearing feedback but the first thing I get is it's an aerial shot. What, what What is it about? So I, I, I love that because it does look like an island. Um, but the composition is a few images. Some are repetitive, um, as you see, and then I play with the, the layout. So I loved just enjoying the process of, of doing it. And uh, my kids always laugh at me because I'm, I'm very old fashioned. I like printing them and playing, you know, laying them out um, and then the process of doing it on the computer for the, the printing um, is another phase. But in general, um, I mean, uh, there is my shadow also in, in it, which I see also a pattern repetitive in my work is when I take images that no one really knows it's, it's my shadow in the work, but when you look closely, oh, wow. my shadow. A Sorry. Absolutely, I hadn't noticed that. Thank you for uh, pointing that out. But I, I, I want to talk a little bit about the, you know, the the way you put it together, right? This glass grid, like almost as a very, you know, geographical map, right? But it's actually this this object, and you you seem to in your practice to transform real objects into those sort of organic free-flowing looking objects that have the viewer, you know, wonder what it really is, right? This this looks like a very sort of, as you said, an aerial shot. And that's what I thought when I saw it in your studio. And oh, this is one of the Bahrain's islands probably, uh, yeah. but it's not. Is this something that you have um, uh, continuously used this playfulness in your, in your work or is it just this series? Um, 
the, in the latest body of work that I just exhibited at Al Barah, it's more structural where I, I've mirrored the image. So it, it's not as organic as this piece. Um, but this piece, I'm very much inspired by David Hockney as an artist. So he had um, a phase where his collages and, and his work, um, he had this grid-like Polaroids. And um, I, I, the way I've presented it is I've printed it um, as paper, but it's acrylic uh, sheet and aluminum backing. So when you look at the piece in the gallery, it gives you a shine because I didn't, you know, I wanted the viewer to feel that um, shimmer of the water and, and the acrylic sheet on top gives me that. And I, and I just felt I liked having this spacing within, whereas my current body of work, I didn't keep the spacing, the gaps between the, the squares. Um, because I liked the uh, the the patterns, the Islamic patterns that were coming up within within the the work. Fantastic. I mean, for the viewers, there is actually no, um, you know, you can get close to the work in the gallery when you come to see it in person. There is actually no glass covering the work. You can get really close and there they almost look like shiny tiles, as you're uh, mentioning, Marwa. But this this work helped us open and the article mentions it as well, helps us open this whole conversation on water, right, that is rooted in the theme of the show and in the title, the Sea of Life, Bahrain in Arabic, meaning the two seas, the sea and the fresh water spring. So this work, even as we created the show, is the opening of uh, you know, the work of other artists who are more directly looking at this issue. And one of them is, is Mashail. And I want to turn to you, uh, Mashail, to, to speak about the, your practice, but also the two works that we have in the show, Submerge and Adari Mitopia, that are tied to the Adari Spring myth. And maybe as you take us along for your, our viewers, you explain a little bit what this story is so that they can better understand uh, your work. Over to you. Thank you, um, Marwa. It's such a pleasure to be on this panel with you. And Lean, thank you for having us. Um, very grateful to be um in conversation talking about my favorite element. Um, so I think you, you'll see that a lot of the artists within the show, like the concept of water, but also like the fundamental relationship that we have with water is so um, deep rooted. And um, it, it happens to be a consequence of the geography, but also our affinity and our relationship to the rituals that are attached to water itself. Um, my research primarily focuses on um, thinking about um, mythologies and kind of acting like a time traveler uh, to presuppose what, what was encapsulated in certain mythologies at a certain time and how the reconjuring of that mythology in present time, what does it bring up? Um, so really thinking about what are these embedded worldviews that are uh, within a context or a story and how um, the role of the artist or the role of the audience can um, also breathe new life into said mythologies. Um, I'm going to quickly share screen for um, reference, but also to just go through some of the works. Um, this is um, a photo that I took at um, Adari Pool. Uh, which is the main site of the research that I've been working on for the past few years. Um, the infatuation that I initially had with the site was that um, A, the etymology of the word itself, Adari, Adra, um, meaning virginal, um, had initially piqued my interest. But then also having um, grown up not too far away from this particular site, um, it kind of uh, simmered in the back of my consciousness and um, I, I began kind of uh, thinking about the different stories that collapsed onto the site that I couldn't access. Um, I have uh, stories from my grandmother about the site that I could not relate to because I was not alive nor present during its heyday. Um, its heyday being a time where the spring was in full force, a site um, for um, a communal meeting ground, um, um, a very healing property as well as water often has. Um, 
And so I began playing with this idea of um, a false nostalgia or a false um, sense of connection to the site. Um, and one of the ways that I um, was really playing with um, this work is thinking about all of the different mythologies that were attached to the site itself. Now, there are very, very many different versions and very many different stories in relation to water and in relation to um, um springs in general um, in the region, but the one that I was most attached to was um, one of a woman whose tears turned into a magical spring. And this is after um, uh, an occurring incident that um, left her um, kind of mourning as if. Um, and so her body and her tears itself turned into the spring. So it became a story of a, an origin story almost for um, the site. I was really attached to that because I'm thinking about um, my own relationship to water and my own relationship to the body. Um, this site started to encapsulate all of these um, thematics that I was thinking about. Um, and I began the exploration as I do as a photographer um, collecting images of um, new sites in which I could imagine this mythology to occur. So um, this series actually takes many different forms. Um, my initial research, research started in the photo series False Pools, where I was uh, driving around Bahrain, um, oftentimes after a rainstorm or um, a wet period uh, to look for new springs, new false springs where um, this embodied um, mythological woman had cried and then turned into a spring. And um, it became this uh, practice of collecting, um, which I think a lot of artists um, engage with as well is um, how do we how do we think about these things that start to permeate into the everyday. And so I became really infatuated with collecting um, photos of all of these spaces where um, I could imagine um, a female horror to occur, um, which finally took me to the second piece um, within the show, which is um, Submerged. I, um, in contemplating the heroine of the story, I was really thinking about her embodying her position and the way in which she began to um, transform into water. So this is actually a double exposure uh, shot that I took um, of uh, this imagined um, humanoid um, woman who is, is, is drowning, is submerged in this darkness, but also in this light of the water. Um, and, um, you know, the, the story continues to fork into new questions for me. And I'm really interested to hear, um, especially in the form of Q&A, um, how uh, the audience has engaged with the work. Um, that always brings me to new lines of thinking. Um, and also in relation to Marwa's work, thinking about reflections, how much of our own personhood is uh, related in these elements. Um, and especially as women, I think, um, is something that I think is quite obvious um, in this panel discussion as well. Yeah, thank you for sharing, Mashail. There is a lot of um, intimacy in, in your work. And I think um, uh, people notice that and, and stop and, and love to hear that story and how, you know, the process, but in your work, beyond the fact that it's very intimate and personal, you seem to play on the dualities of a moment and a memory mm -hmm. and of the physical, the, the physical aspect of a place and the emotional aspect of the place when the place is not there. Talk a little bit about that. I mean, you, you've told us why you were interested in this, but the manner in which you approach this memory and, you know, moment and... Yeah, thank you for the thoughtful question. I think that um, oral histories have such uh, immense power. Um, oral histories themselves kind of, um, they exist on the fringes, I would say, of a, a common codified history. And so... Um, mythologies kind of fall under that umbrella for me. And I think that um, um, 
Heisei or stories that, you know, you are um, gifted from a matri matrilineal lineage also becomes um, a site for those um, perhaps coded secrets, um, little realities. I think about these as, as, like I said, like existing on the sides of, um, of a, of a reality of the way in which we um, exist. And so um, in thinking about your question about uh, memory and how we traverse memory, um, I think a lot about how much of history is a constructed memory and how much of, um, especially as we're, you know, thinking very much about the future, but also about the past, um, how much of that is um, an artist's ability to kind of reflect on those two moments simultaneously within the present. Um, so I guess that's why I started speaking about this time traveler aspect. I've been thinking about that a lot and and that, mm -hmm. um, you know, um, it's kind of some somewhat the duty of artists to reflect on um, the praxis in which they're practicing their work. Thank you for that, uh, Mashail. I'd, I'd like to show and share uh, the work, the beautiful work of Jafar El Orebi, who's who's not with us, but his work is uh, sits in the gallery um, just across from Mashail's work on on in this small um, section of our gallery that is light filled as well. And um, as we look at his slides, and we'll have them up for you in a moment. Um, uh, Jafar shares that his artistic journey has been a continuous process of transformation and exploration, aiming to find a distinctive language that reflects his identity. He draws inspiration from the rich cultural heritage and the local environment presenting timeless essence in a contemporary and unique way. And what we're seeing now on the slides here is from the series that we have in the show. And he says, one of my ongoing project is titled um, The Salt Lakes, part of my topography series. It involves field research, exploration, and the use of maps. I have been studying a 70 year old Bahraini worker who extracts salt using rainwater in a natural area called the Sabha which is, I guess, the Salt Lake marshes. Instead of digging channels, he relies on the changing colors of the water to indicate salt formation, creating beautiful scenes known as salt roses. I visited a small marsh in an industrial zone to observe and document the salt formation process. Despite its location, the area is teeming with life, including salt, trees, rare plants, the sea, and birds. Through interview, photography, data, collection, and sample gathering, I draw inspiration from my work. I think we can go through the few other slides that we have. So this is the area that he is referring to that he visited. And maybe we can hold this for a little bit. And I just wanted to say that during my trip in July, when I visited Jafar in his studio, he was he showed me some of this work. He was still in the process of figuring out this project of, he was uh, regularly visiting this site, taking photographs. And he told me about that Bahraini, 70 year old Bahraini worker, um, how much time he'd spent with him to interview him, et cetera. Um, we can move to some other slides until we get to the work that we have in the show. This is another shot of the site, I guess, the Salt Lake sites. Yet another one. And this is the work that we have in the show. And he says, why salt? Salt hold historical and cultural significance. It has been important for exploration, trade, and even used as a currency, causing sometimes conflict. Today, it remains essential for food and industry, tied to cultural practices and religious rituals. Interestingly, animals searching for salt helped create major land routes long before 
humans existed. And this work in the show um, is shown along with four other smaller works that are aerial photos of the site that Jafar uh, visited, the Salt Lake, the Sabha site. And onto that, he drew over the image and smudges it with salt. I want to believe salt from the site. And then this bigger, much larger work is, I want to say, his own interpretation, his own vision, uh, or the way he saw the work after, uh, you know, as he was um, uh, in, involved in this research project. And I want to say how fascinating, uh, you know, the roles that you are all taking in, in discovering and, and maintaining and some histories and some rituals, but also um, talking about them in the now and in the future, having people think about them. Uh, that's that's just such a wonderful um, way to approach uh, the art. Um, um, uh, I think we can bring the slide down. I'd like to um, turn to you again, Mashail, to speak about, you know, your artistic practice and, you know, in, in the broader art scene in, in Bahrain. During my visit, I was really moved and, and touched by how much attachment and tenderness and care there seems to have been from artists towards their land and resources. And you've spoken about this. Do you think this is, that has this always been the case? Or is this something that artists such as you, like, you know, Marwa, yourself and Jafar are sort of, uh, for some reason, trying to uh, raise awareness about uh, the fact that this rich history means so much and to raise awareness about issues of preservation, of water, mythology. Um, that's a great thought. I think that um, I can speak towards my own practice and that I'm guided mostly by the curiosity um, of discovering each and every one of these newfound, um, whether it's discovering the mythology itself or discovering these occurrences that um, that lead me to the path of the work. And that's been my approach. But I also think that it's it's inescapable to be thinking about climate futures um, and in terms of resources to think about the ways in which, you know, water was our prime resource at one period and how that's, um, you know, been evolving and changing and how we're at present we're thinking about like the cultural resources as well um, and um, information capital as opposed to um, resource capital so um, I think that you know it's inescapable to be in in consideration of land having you know been um, uh, directly affected by um, resource management itself or, or the ways in which we're engaging with water um, and yeah, amongst uh, you know the the wider conversations of um, land use. Marwa, what are your thoughts on this? On on the fact that you know artists are using their art and you know using new cultural expressions and you're muted, Marwa. Okay. Yeah, I didn't you. So basically, I feel all of us, the commonality that I see in our work, that we're very much inspired by our, our surroundings in Bahrain. Um, and how we present it is, is it's beautiful that everyone is presenting it in a totally different way. Um, culturally, I think we're very much attached and influenced, whether it's by the waters of Bahrain, or like I have a series on palm trees, but Mishal has really gone deep into the meaning um, and the stories behind it. It's so nice to hear that. I, I, I haven't heard it before. Thank you. And I, 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 I want to segue into that because, uh, you know, um, artists like yourself, Mashail, and Jafar have, and, and we have another artist as well in the show, Mariam and Noaimi, who was with us in a previous conversation, have really embraced a new, maybe it, it's not, it's for you to tell me, uh, you know, uh, 
new cultural expressions that are based on research and observation and almost a uh, you know, an archiving process. Are those new cultural expressions in uh, Bahrain? Uh, what is the audience response for that? Are they triggering something new in the art scene? Are they helping audiences to think differently? Are they maybe creating different types of collectors who are interested in this work? Um, I want to read something from Jafar, but I want to hear from you first, Mashaan. Sure. Um, well, I think that what it's definitely funneling into is a very rich conversation. And I think that uh, having artists that are continually engaging with the site, sites being water, but also from different angles, it becomes a very holistic understanding of what state are we at right now in terms of thinking about our relationship to land. Um, and I also think, especially with Jafar's work, there is there is a level of uh, mythology and myth making, but also a level of, um, you know, incorporating archaeological or perhaps um, um, practices that are um, focusing on the sciences, but also within the arts. So it becomes very intersectional in terms of uh, mediums. I want to read something from uh, Jafar and he's shared with us. Since the early 19s, I have been part of Bahrain's vibrant art scene. I found inspiration in art books and the annual fine arts exhibition, which is now in its 50th edition. Bahrain's visual art scene is rooted in its deep historical and cultural heritage, with a rich legacy dating back to the ancient civilization of Dilmun. Bahrain's artists have made significant contributions and gained recognition both locally and internationally. Bahrainis artists embrace global perspective and adapt to new tools and advancement. They combine their cultural heritage with contemporary expression. Um, and he goes on to speak about um, the need for institutional support, and we'll get that. I just wanted to get a few words in uh, as to how um, he saw things. Uh, um, Let's discuss, uh, you know, your experiences being artist in, in Bahrain. How easy was it for you, Marwa, to become an artist? Like, you know, if, you know, how, how, how easy was it to study art, to practice professionally? You know, can you speak about this so people can get a, a better idea of, you know, if you decide to become an artist in Bahrain now, you're young, and how do you go about doing it? Is there an art education from your personal experience take us to the broader perspective well the beauty of يعني, being in Bahrain is that we have a lot of artists that come th through the galleries but for me it started young because my mom exposed me to taking me all to a lot of the, the workshops and um, that were happening from simple things like tie-dye to porcelain painting actually Michelle's aunt uh, taught me porcelain painting and uh, it's it's exciting because uh, that journey didn't stop in within me. Um, it continued. And then in high school, I did um, IB art for the International Baccalaureate. And um, my examiner was uh, one of the Bahraini artists, uh, Abraham Sharif, who encouraged me to continue. Um, I, my mom wasn't too thrilled about me studying in university full time. Uh, so I did communication studies in Emerson, uh, Boston, but I maintained while I was there at the Museum of Fine Arts and took courses uh, like simple things, even uh, book binding, you know, it's just the skill and learning new techniques was always something I'm interested in. When I got back to Bahrain, uh, visiting artists from Syria and Sudan, and whenever they had a gallery, like for al Barah, if they have an exhibit, they would do a workshop for us. So I would also take part. Now, I, I feel it's very, uh, encouraging for the new generation. My daughter now is at Mass College of Art in Boston uh, because the same thing, I, I did take her to courses um, 
as long as your parents are supportive, because I, I used to run um, an exhibition uh, for, for children, a literature and an arts competition. And sometimes when the parents are not very supportive and feel like, oh, but you know, art, you, it's not uh, your income and it's not very supportive and, and so on. So sometimes it derails them from continuing. But I always encourage students who do have the interest and the passion and creativity is to to maintain it uh, you know whether it's my my brother is into music so he used to always say i don't see myself in a desk job and i and i always say it's a balance so um you know in bahrain it's nice that we have a very supportive system being also um now the president of the bahrain art society it's it's encouraging because we constantly have um exhibitions and um we also try to have workshops. Uh, you know, last week we had one for for sculpture, and 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 I feel being in Bahrain, from the GCC countries, we are ahead because of of the background, and uh, we we have from the founders of of the artists who started in Bahrain. Mm -hmm. Mashail, what are your thoughts on this? How has it been for you? And and looking at uh, you know what what would what do you think uh, um, Bahrain is in most need of, or the young artists in Bahrain are most in need of? I think that in terms of what we need, it's definitely institutional support comes at uh, a huge importance for sure, because I think that, um, you know, in terms of even being able to support an artist's livelihood, be, to be able to support this full time, these are the difficult conversations with becoming an artist full time. These are the things to consider. Um, I do think another thing that is really important that I have found a lot of solace in is that um, my peers, my community, um, artists that are working alongside me as collaborators and um, um, can really extend the generosity of critiques, can extend the generosity of um, uh, collaboration. Um, these communities themselves, I feel like, especially at present, are continuing to disenfranchise themselves from the West and kind of looking inwards and thinking about how we can prop each other up. Um, not only within Bahrain, but in regionally um, within the art scene, um, how we can be looking at, you know, indigenous practices, um, histories that perhaps we're not aware of, um, and use that as like fertile ground to like really build a um, sustainable arts ecosystem. Yeah, and we can certainly see that in some of uh, the artist works in the show that that drive to 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 look inward. Um, we have a question for you, Mashail, and I will give it to you. I just want to read um, from uh, Jafar, who says, um, institutional support has played a crucial role in the achievement and the growing um, art scene in Bahrain, uh, but he also underscores the importance of international collaboration, such as the one that we've just embarked on together, MEI and the National Arts um, uh, Council in Bahrain, and to, to create those conversations, right, across uh, borders and to have people uh, discover your art. Let me take the question before I sort of open the conversation to the, our last and final frame. I want to look ahead with you all and discuss some projects that you have and your views about some things. So uh, this is a, a question. Um, I have a question for Mashail, such a big fan, from uh, Josh, Josh Choi, and I hope I haven't uh, mispronounced uh, the last name. Have you seen Bahrain's perception acceptance of mythology change throughout your life, maybe even from your parents' and grandparents' life? Mm, thank you for the question. Um, I think that um, mythologies or storytelling has always been a huge kind of pillar of the ways in which I've engaged with um, my family and I think that some of my earliest and most living memories have been my of my grandmother telling me a lot of um, little stories that she heard when she was growing up and the story would always change I remember every time she would uh, 
um, retell it, which I thought was so playful about storytelling itself. Um, I think that the, the ways in which it has evolved is that now I, I've seen and I'm excited about uh, the ways in which um, we're really looking um, from a research perspective at these in, into these little stories um, that they can't just be infantile but they're actually saying something louder and perhaps um, more um, important. Okay, and since we are on this uh, this topic of the Bahrain, yes, Marwa, please, did you want to say something, to add something? Okay, but I'm going to come to you, uh, Marwa and Mashal, to get your views since we are on this topic of, <clears throat> excuse me, the Bahrain art scene. We have a question. Uh, maybe help us understand better why Bahrain has such a rich history of art and culture, unlike some of the other, G, uh, of the other Gulf states. Many here in DC are surprised to see such great art coming out of Bahrain and to learn that it has a rich history of art. Maybe explain the historical influence. Thank you. So Marwa, do you want to take this and maybe speak to why is Bahrain has such this rich art scene, Absolutely. arts and culture that goes back? Yeah, I clearly mentioned a little bit, uh, but basically the education system was very supportive. Uh, our education system started earlier than other GCC countries uh, in, in the 20s. And um, later on, there were artists that were sent on scholarships to, uh, you know, Belqis, uh, Fakhro, um, a few of them who have been on scholarships um, and benefited from, th there was no such thing as, oh, you know, like in other countries, like it's taboo and no, you shouldn't practice art or uh, because, you know, also uh, Islamically, uh, in Islamic senses, it, there was this thing about, no, you shouldn't depict, you know, um, you shouldn't put portraits up in your home. That's, I mean, uh, there, there was that stigma, but being having a generation like my parents, uh, my my mom went to the AUB, and I feel we were very much exposed to uh, different cultures early on. My great grandfather traveled a lot and collected art, also from my you know seeing in my my grandmother's house, I see African art on the wall. I mean, you know, it's just exposed to and and I I clearly remember, you know, it's not just local art but she also collected from local printers um and and i have an appreciation that that starts so as a as a society um a lot of collectors also are also in bahrain the, the appreciation and we have saudis who come as artists and say we learned from your artists which which is very nice to hear because you can tell that it really started early on the 50th anniversary of um, the annual art show is day after tomorrow in Bahrain. I mean, that in itself, knowing and there is a prize that's given out. So the artists also are encouraged to submit art every year um, and knowing that there is a, a, you know, a government body that's solely looking at the art scene and sending us, uh, they've sent me uh, abroad also to participate, uh, which is very e exciting. Thank you. Mm. Mashahad, would you like to add to this? Yeah, I think I'd like to challenge what has been said in the question, because I do think that we have a long history engaging with the arts, and it's just that there has not been perhaps the education from the West looking at the types of art that we've been engaging with. For, for, for a very long time. And I think that, um, you know, exhibitions like this really help bridge that experience, but it's it's not that it hadn't existed before and that the other, um, our other uh, kind of communities in the region also have not engaged in that. It, it becomes a kind of a question of what is accessible? Like how can we gauge what is accessible in terms of our art history and what has been documented? Yeah, just so that I don't misunderstand, the question does say that the art scene has existed for a long time in Bahrain, uh, unlike maybe some other places in the Gulf, and that, you know, people 
possibly did not know about this uh, this existence. But I get your point in in um, in that. Another question to Marwa: um, What do you hope for the artists of Bahrain to obtain within the next ten years? And to Mashail, does the new age philosophy influence how you interpret Bahrain's mythology? Let's take one by one. Um, uh, Marwa, would you like to respond first since we were with you? Uh, what do you hope for Bahrain's artists in the next 10 years? My hope has always uh, been and will be is to take the Bahraini artist to exhibit out of Bahrain. Um, when I came onto the, the the society, I mean that was my main goal. And uh, last year we went to Art Debay. Uh, we took four artists. This year we're now arranging to go to Kuwait. Uh, having this cultural exchange, uh, we're doing it with their society there, um, and then they'll come visit us. But we also went to Oman last year. Um, we're doing regional. And um, Sheikh Rashid has been extremely supportive about uh, taking us out of just the region. Um, and, and this is a perfect example um, of, of having our art in Washington, D.C. Yes, and before I jump to Mashail and have her take her question, I just want to say that Marwa has uh, mentioned two uh, very prominent artists in Bahrain in her conversation, but Is Fakhru, a pioneering Gulf a woman artist whose uh, we have a piece of her in the show, and just mentioned uh, Sheikh Rashid Al Khalifa, who's first and foremost Bahrain's art patron and collector, the director and founder of the Rack Art uh, Foundation, who's done a lot for artists and to support the art scene, but also as a prolific artist and two of his stunning installations uh, are in the show. Um, we have a few more questions I will weave in, but I wanna get to your future projects as well. So Mashail, uh, coming back, um, does the new age philosophy influence how you interpret Bahrain's mythology? Maybe briefly so that we can go to the other questions. Um, I think that my, and I think it depends on where we're approaching this definition of new age philosophy. I think that um, first and foremost, I, um, I try to relate to the mythology itself through the matrilineal lineage that I'm accessing the stories from. Um, so I think that kind of speaks louder than um, kind of contextually where I'm, I'm coming from. But also I do think that um, you know, the positionality of a new age way of thinking about mythology kind of peeks through by virtue of context. Thank you. Thank you, Mashaan. Um, uh, let me give that, uh, let me give you that uh, question, Marwa, since we're on uh, art and artists in Bahrain. Who are some of the artists in Bahrain or the Gulf or abroad who influence and inspire you? And how do you see your work connecting to the wider art world? The last part of the question is a very broad. So uh, in the uh, for time, maybe you can take the first part and we'll see if my question will uh, to you will answer that. So maybe just quickly, any Bahraini artists or Gulf artists besides David Hockney and the Westerners who inspire you? Well, definitely, I have to say, Sheikh Rashid Khalifa has been a big um, inspiration because my mom took me to see an exhibit of his um, years ago um, in, in France. And I, I remember the colors and the it was all about flowers um, and uh, still life. And um, I was I was amazed at that collection of, of seeing the full collection because I, I've seen, you know, uh, um, single pieces here and there. Uh, Sheikh Rashid is also very conservative when it comes to uh, what is shown. And I haven't seen much growing up when I was, but then I saw, and I remember um, um, Mishael's aunt had a piece of his, which was a Spanish dancer and and I and I was very amazed at the the color co and uh, the composition and just the flow because I felt that, that the Spanish dancer was actually like moving, um, and and uh, I'm a, you know being a, 
a mixed media artist, we also have Camille Zakaria based in Bahrain, who does photography and collage work. And I have taken a few workshops from him. So I've definitely been inspired by by his work um, and technique and documentary photography in particular. Um, so that's firsthand, but uh, so that's more recent. Fantastic. Um, just a last sort of uh, round of questions propelling us a little bit into the future. What are some of the projects you're working on, preparing, exploring some of the themes, Mashain? Um, that is a big question because I think that, uh, you know, the, the story of Adari and this research has taken me, um, the past four years of focus. And so right now I'm kind of thinking about a new medium perhaps that I'm interested in, in working on. And, um, it'll definitely be kind of segueing a different mythology. Um, but very much like Merwa, I think that, um, the fun of being a mixed media artist is that I get to play with new mediums every time I get to another stage. Fantastic. Marwa, is there a new series, a new work, new exhibition in the horizon that you're sort of preparing, a new theme? Well, I just started um, uh, this new theme that is um, the Islamic patterns, um, and it's very much inspired by um, it's block work um, and uh, that I've taken in Bahrain with lines and it's very simple, the actual image, but um, and it's translated into bigger compositions, which is currently being um, exhibited at uh, El Barah and the uh, day after tomorrow, uh, there's uh, another few compositions that will be at the museum for the 50th annual art show. Um, but that's my latest thing. And I'm planning to explore more because the it's like endless uh, possibilities of what can be uh, presented. In, in. Indeed. And uh, Jafar shares with us that he's currently in the early stages of a navigation project and also working on a project related to palm trees and dates, blending research with aesthetics. Um, and uh, that is about what he's uh, shared with us on this. Um, just to wrap up, um, you know, the show has been incredible for us. The feedback we are receiving is beautiful. We get a lot of different audiences coming into the gallery, uh, schools, you know, people in policy, you know, congressional staffers tomorrow hosted by the embassy. So a wide range of audiences just, uh, you know, in the nature of who we are being the Middle East Institute in Education Policy and Arts uh, Center looking at the Middle East, we get, we we get this very diverse audience and that's in a, in a way our strength. But what do you, from where you are sitting, what do you hope audiences will take away from the show when they step in and, and uh, see the work? Mashai, just last few words maybe. You're muted. <laughs> you are muted. <laughs> I have a tendency to go on a tangent. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, perhaps I think, um, you know, the sensitivity to our resources that we are um, engaging and trying to reflect on with these, each individual piece. Marwa? I, uh, you, you answer, you said it and I'm, uh, because I wasn't sure what has been the feedback and the fact that you mentioned that the feedback has been that people are, are surprised that this is coming out of Bahrain. This is you know, very encouraging. And I'm happy that it made people think about, you know, because sometimes I feel there's this on the Middle East that, you know, there is this like, I know there's a big interest currently in, in Middle Eastern art, but I, there was a question mark about, but I feel this show answered a lot of questions to the viewers that attended. Indeed. And it's sort of a, uh, um, uh, shared uh, the beauty and uh, the interconnectedness of, uh, you know, the works and the different generation and the different art forms. It's also visually very beautiful, as I said, but congratulations to you all and to all that uh, you are doing inside of Bahrain and outside of Bahrain, uh, carrying the flag of, of the art scene and, and the work of the artists who are 
uh, pushing boundaries and, and addressing so many important issues in, in our time. And um, again, our time has, has come to an end, unfortunately. I want to thank you for this fascinating conversation, both Mashal and Marwa and Jafar. We missed you, but I uh, hope that I've uh, given a little bit of justice to your words and to your work. Um, for our audiences, please check our exhibition and the work of our three guests today uh, by visiting the show or joining us on the first Friday that's coming up on February 2nd. Uh, we will be here open until 8 p.m. We'll give a few gallery shows. Um, and with that, I hope everybody has a great rest of the day and follow us on social media, Twitter at MEI Arts Culture. And thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.